let's call a meeting to order at uh, looks like 10 minutes after five. Um, we have some guests with us. We have Christine. I'm sorry, I don't know your last name. Babcock. 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 Okay, yeah. welcome. That's me. And we have Matt. We have Matt Pelkey and Vic Dwyer and Paul Seminera, a road foreman, is also here with us. And I believe <coughs> we have an amendment. Phil. His Phil's here. Phil's now here. We'll see if his audio is working. He's still Phil. Scott Bowden is here too, uh, Peter Hood. Okay, I see Scott, yes. Welcome, Scott. Phil. Um, I do not see Phil. 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 Can, can, Phil, can Phil read this? Is that backwards? <laughs> <laughs> no, I see. I had to use my phone. I couldn't get in on my computer. Uh -oh. Because you're you're, because you're you're logging in on the town account. I wasn't though. I was using your link from the agenda. Really? Okay. Yeah. Well, you're coming I, up. I, the, you're the only one coming up as the town of Middlesex. Am I now? Yeah. Yeah. What? Yes. <laughs> Guys, he just changed his name for another meeting, probably. Well, yeah, probably, I. You that's, that's, you did a ZBA meeting. You logged in as the right. town of Middlesex for the ZBA meeting, and it immediately defaulted to that. Yeah, it must be. I'll have to, another time. I'll go back and change it. So it's. But anyway, well, this we've is. Got you. We've got you now. Yeah. Okay. Sarah, just to catch you up, he called the meeting to order at five ten and welcomed all the guests. Okay. Great. So Phil, you want to uh, amend the agenda, correct? Yeah, for an appointment to the ZBA. Okay, under new business. Or other business? Other business, yeah. Okay, thank you. So uh, with that, we have a request from the Romney School for permission to use a budding town land for open classrooms in the upcoming school year. Action likely. <laughs> Matt and Christine, I presume. Yes. So we did We did receive the letters. Did everybody get the letters? Yes. Letters? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so we are, we're hoping to um, use some space in the woods and then perhaps some use uh, the tennis courts to set up uh, some tents. Um, I also was wondering um, how the town would feel if we had kind of a, a shelter for a, a outdoor privy. Um, it would be like a, we would have a portable bucket uh, for, for, for poo <laughs> um, and um, kind of shelter it in a very like um, nothing too fancy. Actually, Charlie has offered to help with that, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, are there any questions? We, we are just, um, you know, taking into account the Virus, virus transmission, um, how it's safer outside, and just like the benefits of being outside for young children, um, it can perhaps turn what is a difficult situation into an opportunity um, mm -hmm. for for us. You know, to kind of reimagine how we deliver um, mm -hmm. our learning outside. So I think if with the town's approval, if we are able to. Um, use those spaces, I think it would be a really, um, a really benefit, a, a, a huge benefit for our children and our community. So you are proposing to use the part of the tennis court, which is not currently configured as a tennis court, correct? Yes. Or do you want to, Christine, you want you to can, take down the yep. net and disable the no, one operational no, tennis court? There's no need to um, take down the net. Um, Christine, do you, if sorry. you want to jump in. Yeah, sorry, I, I got disconnected for a moment there, but I'm back. Um, I, yeah, I would agree with everything you said, Matt, and um, our intention with the tennis courts is not to, to take down the nets or anything. Um, you know, we hadn't decided specifically on which of the courts to use, um, but definitely not the whole space so that others can can still access that, um, that space. Um, and I guess uh, that's fine. I guess my other question is, how are you, you're not gonna drill into the tenant, how are you gonna 
how are you going to support the tent? Yeah, yeah that I think will depend on the, the tent we get. Um, we won't, I don't imagine drilling into the courts. I imagine it'd be kind of with some extended rope attaching it either to stakes in the, the ground off of the courts or tying it to other, you know, some of the fencing or things like that. Um, okay, I just would, you know, usually, usually they're either great big stakes or these great big, I don't know what size tent you're talking about, but these screw things are big stakes that you drive in the ground and you definitely cannot drive those into the tennis court. They'll destroy it. 30 by right. 30 is what they want. A tent 30 by 30. Uh, yeah, so we, yeah, we pretty, may, yeah. we're we may still, adjust that we're, size. We were, oops, sorry. <laughs> go ahead, Christine. We were originally looking at a 30 by 30. Um, we found some slightly more portable ones um, that are 18 by 20. Um, and so, you know, we possibly put one to two on the courts because 18 by 20 wouldn't fit a full class socially distanced, um, but two should um, for, for inclement weather or hot sunny days. Um, so it'd be like, you know, 36 by 20 or uh, 40 by 18. Yeah. So with the key. I, 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 it, but different you classes. Talk to the. You need to talk to the tent company. But I can just tell you, I'll bet you anything they're going to want to drill into that tennis court, and I think that's going to be a problem. What's well, not? You don't think it. You know it, right, Peter? You know. Well, it's I, I I don't know, Mary. Maybe maybe they have a scheme where they are <laughs> going to tie them up. Tie them up to the. No, fence. I'm saying we we don't want drilling. We know it's going to be a problem if that's what they want to do. Right. So right. yeah, we would not we would not ruin the tennis court if there was any no. that we would incur, then we would we wouldn't move forward. The other with, thing, uh, the other thing that I've seen tent companies use, which might work depending on the size of the tent, is that they have mm -hmm. things roughly the size of a car tire, which are filled with cement, just big weights, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. those something like that probably would work. Or, or That's a great idea. You sand logs. That yeah. Might yeah, sand, sand, yeah. sand, sand logs. So, Peter, in terms of um, permission, if there's anything that the town does not want to be have happen, like drilling into the tennis courts, um, could we could you be clear on that? Um, just because I think it, you know, it's probably a uh, work in progress as to how best to secure the tents. Um, here's here's the problem. Here's the problem, guys, and I I want to be, <laughs> and I'm just just speaking for myself now, but other board members can pitch in. I have no problem with the school using town land and facilities in this, usually any time, but especially in this COVID time. So mm -hmm. that's fine. But what I want to do is I don't want, if you want to take down some dead trees, <laughs> I have no problem with that. But don't start, don't start cutting down live trees and creating open spaces and leaving yep. piles of brush around and making a mess. I'm hoping when this is over that you can restore whatever you've been using to more or less the way it was or better. I mean, if you're improving it, if you're creating trails, if you're doing things like that, I think that's fine. But mm -hmm. we just we just don't want a mess that we have to deal with afterwards. Ab absolutely, yeah. Our, our intention, won't, we won't cut any live trees. It was just the, the dead trees that could potentially, you know, fall and, and injure someone. Um, and, and we hear you about keeping it, keeping it, uh, natural and, and that's, you know, that's part of the, the North branch course that both Matt and I have taken is really enjoying and appreciating, you know, the, the space as is and not, you know, other than taking down those, those dead trees, um, we wouldn't envision doing a whole lot of, you know, okay. um, changing other than just the, the, uh, wear and tear of people being there. Um, yep. what size are the dead trees you're going to take down? They, uh, they range in I mean, size. I mean, you're, you're digging down large. I mean, I don't. I don't want you guys or or volunteers with you working taking down big dead trees. That can be very dangerous. Very dangerous. Correct. Um, yeah. Some some are larger than than others, depending on the the space. Um, but that that was something else we were were looking for. Um, if if you guys had any suggestions of you know people who are her experts, any you know foresters. If, um, because we don't want to just, you know, do it ourselves or, or um, you know, 
someone who has a chainsaw, but, you know, we want to do it safely in a way that um, will be good for the, the forest and, you know, the people um, involved. Um, so it, it, there, are loads, there are loads of people in town, including uh, one gentleman who was on this call right now who has more than has the ability to take down those trees, but typically that's part of their business and they get paid for it and it's expensive, depending uh -huh. on the size of the trees. I, I just... <laughs> I don't want to sound like like sour grapes, but I want everybody to be safe. I mean, the worst of this would be somebody gets hit by a dead branch and worst of all dies, but or is seriously injured. That would be the worst. Have you reached out to any of the um, parents at Romney? There may be someone who does that for a living and might volunteer to at least look it over with you. Um, Didn't you have a Facebook you post today or yesterday? Yeah, there was a... We put out a front porch forum post as well as um, it went out in our new uh, school newsletter last night. Um, I don't think we've heard back that anyone does it. Um, and, and Matt, I think you've, you've been getting those replies. I don't think we've heard that anyone yet um, could could do that part. Is that correct, yeah, Matt? Yeah. I mean, like you said, there's lots of lots of people in our community that have a chainsaw and are willing to help, but um, we are wanting somebody um who's for the for the more complicated um jobs <laughs> somebody who's heard or trained guys here's here's yeah. what i would suggest and i know you're right in the middle of trying to figure this out but what i would suggest is we would tonight and i'm suggesting this to the select board um give you the go ahead to work on a plan to do this but then come back to us with the plan when you have which trees you mark you need to cut who's going to cut them down how the tent's going to be installed all those unknown things just so we can be uh just so we can be comfortable and the other thing i would ask is that because there is of course liability associated with this that uh you contact the school's insurer and add the town as an additional insured for where you're using our, our facilities and our forest and our land. Add it to the school's insurance. It should be, it should be very cheap, but we don't want to be, the town doesn't want to be at the head of the line if somebody gets hurt in there in the midst right. of your of, program. Of course, yeah, of course. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Select board members? Ab absolutely. Yeah. We we yeah. appreciate both both your support and your um your you looking out for safety because that's that's really important to us too. Um, do, are there, does anyone, do you guys know names of, of people we could contact about the trees? Do we um, have a town forester? No. Well, we have people, I, you can contact me, Matt, and I'll give you some names of people who okay. do that around town. Great. Okay. And when, when is the next Thank select you. board meeting? The September 3rd? 1st. 1st. Okay, so that that can is there a way that um, if the plan is put together sooner, it can be circulated amongst the select board members because uh, September eighth is the tentative opening for school, um, and I I'm kind of guessing that uh, Matt and Christine would like to have these things up and running by the time school opens. But you can correct me if that's wrong in terms of scheduling. Christine, no, that is correct. That is correct. Uh, yeah. We we are ready to. We, we have we have two things we can do, and I'm looking for input from other board members. One, um, we can pretty easily to put together a, a special Zoom meeting just to discuss your your final plan, or we can appoint a, a subcommittee of the select board, which has the authority to work with you and approve whatever you come up with. Either one is fine with me. So, do we not have to make a motion tonight? Yes. We do. We I want to. Think, I think we should make a motion that's subject to final approval by the committee or the entire board. We are encouraging right. them to go ahead and, and tune up their plan and come back to us with a more detailed proposal. This is just each class going out for one period. And so it's kind of like the whole school uses the same limited facilities outside or. So, so I kind of want to update you what we've done and where our plan is at. Um, we have each, um, Christine, uh, Deanna, and I have identified uh, 
different locations in the woods for each class. So each class could have an outdoor space to use that is separate from another classroom going out there. So we've identified six spots in the woods that would work um, as long as we had um, some trees taken down. Um, mm -hmm. And we were hoping to hang tarps in that those spots. I've, I was ready to, I've, I've got the tarps kind of measured out and ready to purchase once we have approval um, to move forward. So we have that, that part of the plan yeah. done. Um, we've located yeah. the tents um, and what we're, the one piece that we don't have is hiring somebody um, or finding somebody to help um, cut down the trees or and even um, evaluate, evaluate like the, the, safety the safety of some of the trees because we don't have that knowledge. We can't look through the woods and be like that tree is, <laughs> you know, we want somebody to, to, to do a site assessment in those areas to make sure yeah. that it's safe. Um, so that's where we're at uh, as far as yeah, and our plan. So it sounds like what we need to do to, to come back to you is have that person lined up. Um, yep. And is there any other details that you need? Uh, I mean, if we had a map, we sure. could just mark it out. Peter, can we do something that allows them to like start purchasing their tarps and stuff like that? Like, I don't want this to be where everything's at the 11th hour for them. Liz, they can purchase whatever they want. <laughs> but I'm, not, I'm not willing to tell them they can do it until I'm, I'm comfortable and it's safe and they've got an appropriate person to take the trees down, et cetera. Yeah. So, you yeah. know, they can, I mean, I, I'm willing to be as positive as we can be without us, mm -hmm. without us, having a site visit and without you have saying you have had a qualified person walk through the woods and say what needs to be done and have a plan to get it done, Matt. I'm, I'm not trying to be a jerk, but I'm really concerned about a bunch of kids running around in the woods and branches coming down or who knows what. So may I, may I say something, Peter? Yes. Uh, Julie Moore is the head of A&R and she is a former school board member and she lives in town. So I would start yeah. contacting Julie Moore. Have you guys contacted her? No. No, but I had I had her son a few years ago. <laughs> okay, so she would be an excellent person because there are such entities yeah. as county foresters through the state of Vermont, yeah. not the state of Vermont. And I would lean on Julie to get some help that way, a state person, as opposed to going to a private mm -hmm. forester. It's a busy time of year, and I don't think you're going to get it, but the state should probably chip in on something like this. Yeah, and but I... Yeah, and I would say that you could probably get a logger who could tell you about the, you know, what trees need to come down too. I mean, that's their right. business, trees. Have you ever known a logger to work for free? Seriously? I'm not saying that, <laughs> you know, maybe there's a logger who's got a kid at school. Matt, how, how big in diameter are these trees at the base? Christine, can you speak to that? I don't know. I'm not, I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a, we're looking at, you know, six different spaces um and so it's hard to uh, i mean some are pretty big uh like i guess of two feet a foot in diameter maybe um i i it's trait. hard to picture yeah. off the I top guess, of my head so. i guess one yeah. thing also though um and this is something that you had mentioned that you do not want happening so i um it, for some of the the spaces in order for the kids to congregate there are we would have to do a little bit of brush clearing and that we're talking saplings um and so I don't, problem, mm -hmm. I don't have a problem with that. If, if anything, that's going to improve the woods. I just, okay. you know, the, the, I know, I know we're up against a tight time frame, but I just want it to be, want it to be safe no matter what. Yeah. yeah. Um, another thing that we've done, Peter, is uh, you know, we've had um, Amy Butler from North Branch Nature Center, who does this for a living, to site mm -hmm. assessments. And she took the, cl the class, the graduate class up there to help us find these spots. And she's trained in outdoor education and she trained us in doing these site mm -hmm. assessments. And he, she is part mm -hmm. of this process with us. So she's been guiding us along. Um, she sets up outdoor classrooms. She does safety protocols for schools. She would be part of the process in um, training teachers of procedures and protocols to be safe while in the woods. Um, 
and and she, she is like before we set up you have to kind of look and and find all of the potential dangers um there okay. i started so i i've been in the rumney woods for i've been doing eco which is a an after a full afternoon every friday of the kids being in the woods um, and prior to that I did a site assessment I found barbed wire and had to clear the barbed wire and there was a tree um, that was taken down as well um, so i had done part of this work already I've been in um, in there for about five years now um, teaching on Friday afternoons so um, she has been part of uh, the assessment part to, to kind of just um, make sure that we're doing this safely. And she's somebody that oh, we lean on pretty yeah. That's heavily. great. Well, yeah. here's, here's what I'm gonna propose and let's see if, the, we, can, if we can all agree on this, that, that we, will, uh, we will agree agree tonight that you can go ahead with the planning process, um, but before you take down any large trees, I mean, you can clear brush, you can, you know, order tarps, you can do whatever you need to do. But before you take down any large trees or make any substantial changes and certainly, you know, have a plan for how you're going to install these these tents on the uh, tennis court without damaging the tennis court, uh, yeah. get back to us. And as soon as you do that, we'll schedule a special meeting with it as quickly as we can. Um, to hear what you have to say, and maybe we'll maybe we'll want to have a site visit. I don't know how people feel about that, but yeah. I just want to be I just want to be careful. And with that, you can go ahead. And within a few days, once you get back to us, we should be able to give you the final go ahead. And also okay. do the insurance. Yeah. The insurance. Yep. yep. Does that make sense, board members? Yep. yep. Is anybody willing to make that motion? So moved. Second. All in favor? Wait, what's the what's the motion? Just that they may go ahead as long as they get approval at a special meeting? They they can go ahead with their initial planning process and doing doing light work to uh, to prepare, but before we give them the final go ahead, they have a plan for the removal of any dangerous trees and a certification by someone like the person you described, Matt, that She's gone out and looked at these sites and she's satisfied that they're safe. Mm -hmm. And so also subject to getting the town of Middlesex on the insurance policy that the school yeah. has. Right. That was my motion. Yep. You heard that, Sarah. <laughs> I'm still confused, but it's okay. I'll work it out. Um, just so that I'm clear on the insurance piece, I need to, we need to contact the- you know Matt, I'll do that. I'll follow up with the. Um, Matt, Chris is going to do that. I was going to assign it up, but I knew he'd pick Thank it up. You. Thank you, Chris. You're welcome. Thanks, Chris. You're welcome, Christine. So, guys, we'll, we'll, uh, we need to vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so you've got the, what I will call a provisional go ahead. Okay. <laughs> Thank uh, you. Sir. Thank you guys so much. And you've got some work to do. So, Wait, yep. if you would. If you would get back to us through Sarah, when you're when you're uh, when you're ready, we will schedule a meeting as quickly as we can as a meeting. Do we want to do a site visit, board members? Why not? I mean, I wouldn't make a contingent on our site visit, but right. You you could each bring a saw and a chainsaw. Mm -hmm. Very, very <laughs> well, what what I would yeah. suggest is what what I would, and I'm just thinking about this as we go, but maybe we have an on-site, socially separated site visit and special town meeting. I mean, yeah. special select board meeting. Yeah, sounds perfect. So we can do it all, all meet at the school, you show us around, tell us your plan, and uh, sure. we can do it right then and there. Right, Sarah? And, and maybe you'd have Amy Butler there too. You know, Sarah's throwing the, her hands up in the air. She doesn't I just feel like I just feel like I'm gonna work forever. Can I just ask one question? At the at the recreation building, isn't there a small bathroom inside? Disabled. That? Disabled. Disabled. Yeah. It's been disabled forever. Yeah. We filled it with sand or something. That's too bad. 
Well, it is kind of too bad, but you talk about a nightmare. I, I had my share of fun dealing with that thing. I don't want to go back to that, I can tell you. <laughs> I what mean, about a far, let, me, let me just ask you, Matt, how, how far from the school is the farthest site? Well, it's 12 hundredths of a mile, so 0.12, not. <laughs> so going back to the school to use the facilities in the school wouldn't be out of the question, right? Probably. The challenge is if there's only one adult out there, um, but it, it's not out of the question, no. Um, what about running a port? Say, what say that again? Think? What about renting a port alert? You know, a portable toilet. Yeah, we we had talked about that too. Um, the the idea Matt mentioned is is pretty similar to that, um, just a little more kind of you know man, man made. Um, but yeah, we that that's something on the list as well. It's basically the same thing, except you add water to it. Uh, right. The porta potty would be with water and chemicals. This this would be just kind of a shelter area. You have a bucket that the teachers have to um, take care of each day. Oh, um, and and it's, it's, a, it's a bucket, but it's like, it's a portable, one of them's called a luggable loo. It's not just an empty bucket. It has, you know, bags in it that have, um, you know, so that for safe disposal and, um, you know, a small seat. Um, so there's, you know, it's kind of like a camping or hunting I've seen them advertised for. Um, Guys, so come back, come back to us with a come, come back to us with a plan. We don't want to, we don't want to micromanage this, and we don't want to get involved in your turf. We just want everybody to be safe, and we don't want the town to be exposed to a problem, basically. But we're okay. supportive of you using the Sounds town. Good. Great, thank you so much for your time and consideration, and Thanks. we'll get back. To you. Thanks. Anything else? Yep. Anything else, board members? No. Yeah. But... Okay. We're All right. Thanks, Thank guys. You so much. Care. Bye. Thanks bye, for bye. the invitation. Say hi to uh, Matt and Alex and Justin. I and will. Matt. Yeah, I will too. <laughs> okay. Bye. Bye, 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 Matt. Bye. Well, here we go again. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's it's the right thing to do. It's just we got to be careful. I guess that's what I'm saying. Okay, yeah. highway report. Okay. So over the last couple of weeks, uh, we've been ditching on McCullough Hill Road, doing some grading. Um, we've worked at the Notch Road pit to get it ready for McCullough to do to screen his sand. And we finished the, completed that slide that was on Brook Road and both of those items right there, the pit and that slide uh, was done in concert with Dubois Construction and our road crew, which came out pretty good. Uh, currently, we're, uh, McCullough is set up for screening yesterday and they started screening today. Uh, so we're trucking from the Notch Road down on Brook Road to our town uh, garage and then back on center road. So we're trying to alleviate the traffic a little bit. We've also been grading on those roads and we lucked out with a little bit of rain. So the stuff was moist. So we haven't had a, a problem with dust, but we are prepared for that. We've got chloride on hand. We'll make sure the road stays graded and uh, chlorided so that we don't have a problem with that. But that will be ongoing this week and probably well into next week. Uh, as soon as we finish uh, that screening, uh, we'll go back um, and putting up the sand, we'll go back up on McCullough Hill Road and continue that ditching that we've had to leave <laughs> more than once. And we had to buy a culvert for up on Upper Barnett Hill Road. That is in, we've got it. So we'll be doing that also. And I haven't forgot the patch on the Wood Road Bridge. So that will be in the, but it's after our sand is put up. Then we'll get to those items. Can I ask a question, Steve? Sure. Uh, somebody asked me today um, why the bridge um, 
uh, the Middlesex to Moortown bridge is closed. And I wondered if you guys knew why that was. I don't. They're replacing the bridge in Moortown. They're replacing the bridge on Route 100? In Moortown. Yep. So it will be closed for quite a while then, right? OK. Hey, Steve. Um, I think I missed the last select board meeting because I was on vacation. Um, did the potholes, and I haven't been down to Center Road um, past near your house, did those get filled or not? Yes, they did. Yep. <laughs> okay, great, thanks. Which, I'm sorry, which bridge is it that they're replacing? It said the one in Moortown. You can go um, eight miles or something. So I think it's the one that as you, as you get into Moortown or something? No, 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 yeah. no. This is apparently the one between Middlesex and Moortown. No. Right, but they're blocking people from going across that way because they can't get all the way through. Okay, so yeah. even though it's the bridge that's down and eight miles away, you cannot... I, it's the one on the other side of Moortown in those S-turns. So what you have to but do is... Been, the one that's the... been single direction with the traffic light yeah. for so long? I believe so, yeah. Right. So okay. you have to go to Duxbury to, to get over there, right? Yeah. Peter, no, it's because you go... That. Go Peter. ahead, Greg. Yeah, it's, that's... that's uh, that's the bridge across the Mad River in uh, south of Moortown Village, and it will be closed until at least October 17th. And the detour is the Pony Farm Road, uh, which runs parallel to Route 100B. And um, there's no big trucks allowed, uh, but uh, uh, car traffic can go that way. And so it was. it's going to be closed Monday to October 17th for a replacement. It's an accelerated bridge project, which means they have all the components pre-stressed, pre-poured, and they just put them together. That's why it's so fast. Thank Thanks, you. Eric. Yep. So, so can you get on, could you take the, the road, the three mile bridge, Road. Could you take the road that goes by the Scribner farm and then turn left to go down to the villa, go down and then take the detour that Vic was talking about? No. Dorinda, your baby, your well, head. Is it, 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 well, it depends where you're going. You can get across mm -hmm. the Middlesex Bridge, but you're not going to get through Moortown. That's the you whole can get problem. Into the village of Moortown, but you right, can't right. get can't go past the other side on the south end. But I thought that Vic said that you could take Pony Farm Road. That's yeah. right. And then get back onto Route 100 below the bridge, right, Vic? That's correct. But you're in Wartown, not over by Scribner's Farm. No, no, I mean, yeah, but the thing is, you know, I don't, okay, I got it. Can we, yeah. yeah, can we move on? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Anything else, Steve? That, that's it. Okay. Any questions for Steve, board members? Nope. Um, treasurer's report, action possible. Um, I really don't have a lot to report. Um, the one thing I wanted to bring up is in the um, warrant, there's a check for Dubois and King which is mm -hmm. part of the village grant. Um, I sent an email out last week to two members of the planning commission, asking them if the money had been applied for and what the status was, and neither one of them have responded. So I am not gonna mail that check, but um, I don't know if somebody else can rattle their cage. Sarah. <laughs> no, I don't think it's not Sarah's responsibility. No, it's not. Mm. I mean, I think the board should be responding when a question is asked. And certainly they had time. Yeah. Now, that's why I had asked that question, because I know they applied for the grant. I thought the grant was approved. But it was. And the last time. We got to know when that money is available. 
it's available now. I spoke to Mitch, um, I don't know, maybe three, four weeks ago. And um, he said he had not applied for any of the funds yet. And I told him at that point, because he brought up the fact there would be a bill coming in. Um, and I told him that it would be nice to have the money before the bill came in. And I got no response. And I also sent it to Sandy. We're gonna have uh, some discussion on issues related to this in our executive session later. Can I ask a question about the, about the warrants um, for you and maybe Steve? Was that the same chainsaw that we had rep repaired twice? Um, I saw that there were two chainsaw repairs. I wouldn't know that. No. Do you I, don't, I, I don't know. I think it's two separate saws. Mm. Paul is Paul is on the call. Can you hear us, Paul? I I can. I I don't. I didn't realize we had a chainsaw repaired. There was bar and chain oil, but that was it. Weren't there two chainsaw repairs? Dorinda, I mean, I remember seeing them. Well, it I could be, it could be how she entered it. That might be the um, number that it got posted to, the chart of account number under chainsaw repairs that it went to chainsaws, any of the oils or anything like that. Well, there were two for that and then there was one for the oils too. There were three entries, that's all. You know, I, one I don't have the bills here in front of me, so I can't answer to that. I don't know. That's okay. I mean, I just thought I'd have somebody who would know. <laughs> it was Doug Hansen, and I, uh, so that's the fire department, isn't it? The Doug no. Hansen one is, yes. That's a chainsaw repair. And where's I don't the see another chainsaw repair? There's one down toward the bottom, it's $288. Okay, that was the one at Tucker Machine. Was that yours, Paul? No, it was not. The Husqvarna. I mean, that's that's almost the cost of a chainsaw. Right. Well, I'll, I'll be glad. I mean, I. This is one of the problems with these meetings is, you know, the in-person meetings, we can actually look at the invoices and, and answer some of these questions. And it's, it's challenging when we're, uh, when it's the way some of that stuff is coded, I have a hard time figuring it out too. And we're it isn't anybody's fault. Well. It's just, if you can look at the bill, you can tell what it is, but other than that, it's a challenge. All well, I see is the bar and chain oil on there. You don't, but there's two repairs. One's the Husqvarna and one's Doug Lombard. So we know one's, I guess, I mean, Doug Hansen. So that must be fire department, but I didn't even know they had a chainsaw, but there you go. You see the one for yeah. Tucker at the bottom, Steve? The highway department. Oh yes, yep. Chainsaw. Can't hear you, Paul, or whoever you are. I think it's Paul. Paul, well, yeah, it's Paul. It's he's having trouble with the, the internet over where he is. So anyway, there, I do see that repair on there, and I'll, I'll talk to Paul and figure out what that is and get back to the board. Great, thanks. Thank you, guys. Can, can you guys hear me? No. 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 You're just okay. all broken up. Well, we'll have we'll get it all straightened out, right? <laughs> Anything else, Dorinda? Uh, no. So, um, I guess. Well, wait a minute. So, are you in agreement for me to have, hold off sending this check? Yeah. Yeah, I am. Okay. Yeah. 
All right. Oh, and the one other thing is um, I am going to enter into agreement again for Bonnie Batchholder to start our audit process. Um, but she went up $550 in her price this year. And um, last year it was 250 This year it's 550 so I think that it might be time to go out and, you know, see what else is out there. I don't know if you're in agreement or not, but. Didn't we anticipate that happening because she came in super cheap? No, she wasn't any cheaper. No. I thought she was. Dorinda, so, would you say two all, I would, all I would tell you is what I hear in the world of accounting is that the requirements to do these audits every year get more stringent and they require more work and more hours. And I've certainly seen every, every audit I'm involved in paying for, for other organizations, they're all going up in cost. So I'm not saying we don't, I'm not saying we don't put it out, but I'm just telling you, I think this is a, an across the board problem, not just, uh, not just her. Well, this year they don't even plan on coming in. We have to send them everything. Right. They'll take right. and we'll have to photocopy. So it's going to be more work on our end to photocopy stuff and send it to them. Yeah. Well, and also it's what more challenging for them to deal with as well. I mean, you know, you know this is this is the the hidden tax of all this COVID business. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, that's basically all I've got. So we wouldn't, you're not suggesting, Dorinda, that we would go out for this year. We would go out for next year. Next year. For it, next year. It's too late for this year. Um, yeah. And the other part of it is having uh, a new person in. I think it's wise to stick with the consistency of a person who's audited our books before. I agree. And, um, yeah. So. Yeah. yeah, I agree. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Hey guys, I just can I trying to touch back here at the top of Nantro. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. What whatever the bill from Tucker's was was not the highway department, and if it is coded as such, it is incorrect. Okay, I'll check with Amy on that. It doesn't say I. The unfortunate part what I have here just is um, doesn't give how anything was coded. Okay. Yeah, then it must be the fire department, I'm assuming, because we we haven't brought anything there. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Paul. Yep. Uh, okay. You're all set, Dorinda? Yep. Okay. So, uh, extending or ending the moratorium on the 8% late fee that were suspended on overdue 2019 property taxes beginning in March until the end of August 2020 due to COVID-19 action likely. So, so this is just for the for um, last year. No. No. Yes, it just for the end of August. So we're not talking about anything moving forward. Well, that's the question I think this is asking is, do you want to continue to extend that 2019 moratorium, which means people will continue to not have to, I mean, there's no incentive for them to pay their 2019 taxes. If, um, well, we need to, wait a minute, this is for the 8%. So mm -hmm. um, that you were going to, um, that was waived. I think that's a double-ended question here because yeah. uh, you need to approve not charging the 8% for no. the late fees, which I thought was already done, Sarah, wasn't it? There are two 8%. One is the HS-122 that, that the board decided we're not going to penalize people for late filing. The other that one is- 5%. The, uh, 5%. And then there, but it can be up to 8%. The other one was the uh, imposing a, a late penalty. Um, you waived, you held off on imposing a late penalty right. for those taxes, 2019 taxes still delinquent as of May 21st. But you said 
you wanted the board said they wanted to revisit that at the end of August because you right. you asked a question like, well, how long is this going to go? Are we just going to permanently right. lift those? Or are you going to lift them to December? And the board said, well, let's revisit this at the end of August. So here we are. Right. So I have a question. This is Liz. Um, the so we have a tax bill due um, in September, which is from our just our newest tax bill that we got, right? So yes. we're not talking about that. Is that correct? That's okay. correct. So when was the last tax bill due? I can't remember. Mine just comes out on in May. It was due okay, in May. So we're talking about those pay the payments that were due in May. And okay. how many people, Dorinda, didn't pay their taxes or paid it late? It, it was it above normal or was it um, on par I, with what we uh, normally get? I believe we still had quite a few outstanding, but I thought the question was not continuing it. I thought we were waiving the 8% completely on the, because now you would have to go back and charge them 8% on the ones that were still due. I don't know if we can do that, can we? I don't know. Um, no, I think we've waived it. I, I think it needs to just be waived for the 2019, but we are back charging the interest on the ones that still have not paid. We just didn't charge them that 8%. And I don't know if we can go back and charge them that 8% now or not legally. I thought I thought the question was whether we were gonna go ahead and do it for next, waive the 8% for next year. No, it's too early to do anything with that. Okay. So but if you in I'm confused then because if we've already gone past the time when we would charge the eight percent and we've waived it, what are we what are we deciding on now? Well, I don't know. That's my kind of my question. Did we did we waive it or we discussed this at the last meeting I and I don't think we took a vote on it because so it wasn't warned. Do you want me to do you want me to read the message the the uh, I'm just going to read the minutes from the meeting where you guys decided to waive those penalties okay, okay. It's, it's okay. a very small paragraph uh, it said um, the board considered provisions under blah 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 which grants Vermont select boards the ability to delay decrease or even waive penalties so there are three options delay decrease or waive penalties and interest on late municipal and statewide education property taxes until January 1st, 2021. Dorinda suggested the board stress this waiver should only be for 2019 tax bills and that it extend for six months, March of 2020 through the end of August, 2020. The board can revisit this order in August when COVID-19 conditions may have changed. Without such clarification, there would be no reason for anyone to pay their 2020 taxes. So under that house bill, S34, whether it's Senate Bill 344, the board has the option of, of you could impose, you could decrease, but you said you wanted to revisit this in August. You're going to do it for six months. You need to revisit in August. So that is where we are. Um, let me ask a clarifying question, Dorinda. If I'm late, am I charged 8% every month on the balance that I'm late? What is it? Or just a flat fee of 8%? It was a, it's a one-time fee for not paying it by the final due date. And it only comes when we're paying quarterly. It only comes into play on the final due date. That's right. And I think... You pay the last quarter, if you haven't paid all your taxes, you get the 8% penalty. Okay. And to, and to be honest with you, I think my intentions when I said to delay for six months was to delay charging the interest and not so much the penalty because the penalty is a one-time thing. But during the, underneath this, underneath this, uh, according to this uh, emergency measure, select boards have great leeway. They can do whatever they want. So if you wanted to impose, I mean, it'd be a stinky thing to do, but if you want to impose the penalties right now, you could, or you could impose a lesser penalty. Well, I mean, I feel as though, um, I don't know. I think that I would have to go through the list now. I'm no longer the delinquent tax collector, so I haven't really looked at the list. But I'm wondering if it's the usual cast of characters who 
are always delinquent anyways and not people who are really in a hardship. I don't know. But but what would be um so if we if we said we're done um and, and we're done and it's August and we're no longer going to um have the fees suspended, what happens to those people that still haven't paid? So if the people I guess the it would be the people who didn't pay their 2019 taxes by now, they would get imposed. The eight percent. Okay. Or so, whatever but you, those may be paid in in the. When did you say it was due May or something it was like due that? In May, so they could have paid in June. Okay, they, they paid June paid in or July, July, and you didn't impose yes. the eight percent. Okay, right. so our next payment is due September. So yes. those who haven't paid last time are already in trouble because they have September's that they have to pay. Right. Um, so, um, I mean. I think it would be not a bad idea for you to just. Liz, you're breaking up. You're breaking up. There don't be hard to do. Liz, get closer to your phone. You're all broke There's up. There's no phone. Well, Can you I hear know. Me now? Yes. So, um, I, 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 my suggestion is that if it appears that that the people that aren't paying their taxes may be affected by it and whether or not able to either I would hate to post the percent if they finally scraped their money together in October um, because they went back to work or something, even though we know they're already late on their September payments. Um, but I also understand that if it's the sort of the same group of people that are always late, then maybe we say, okay, we're done. But the reality is that COVID isn't done and a lot of people still aren't back to work. And so my recommendation is that we would, for those past taxes, I'd say let's just do it to the January 21st deadline. But that's just my suggestion. January 1st. Gen January what? First? First, yeah. Yeah. And how does everybody else feel? Well, I, I'm all for extending that. So you're just saying, Liz, to extend that until January 1st. Just so for just last year's taxes, yes. Not for September's and not for this and that. That's a whole separate. Right. Yeah. We'll That's address right. that next May. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds I can, cool to me. I can live with that. Me too. Make the motion, Liz. Okay, I move that we um, extend the um, the moratorium on uh, the penalty, the eight percent penalty and interest, or just the penalty. No, no, just no. we've already gone back and started charging interest. Okay, the the, the fee um, until January first, twenty twenty one. For the two thousand nineteen taxes. For the two thousand nineteen taxes, yes. Right. Is there a is there a second to that motion? I'll second that. Okay. All in favor. Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, guys, it is now four minutes after six by my clock. So we need to uh, temporarily adjourn the select board meeting and start up the BCA meeting. I have a question to ask. Am I allowed to be in this and vote if I miss the first meeting? No. No. But you so can listen. Okay, I'll, I'll listen. I have to. I have to go to the Central Vermont Fiber meeting a few minutes ago. So, Sarah, will you text me when the select board meeting is going to come back into session? Yes, we need your cell phone number. I gave it to Sarah. Oh, okay. I <laughs> when I don't have it, I I two, lost it. Two seven she nine didn't... six five zero five. Now we can call them at any hour. Two exactly. Seven, two seven nine. I'm sorry. What's the last four digits? Six five zero five. Okay. Thanks, Bill. Okay. Uh, I'm signing off. You're going into the. Okay, Bill. Okay. Okay, Liz, you're on. Okay, so we're resuming the meeting, the BCA meeting, um, from 
Tuesday, July 28th. Um, hold on. And so we're, we're reopening the hearing. Um, and so at this time, we invite the inspection committee who was um, me, Jan Theron. Is Jan on yet? I think, yes. Yes, she is, I see her. And um, Chris McVeigh, um, who went to the property um, last Wednesday um, and presented our report um, last night. So Chris McVeigh is going to present um, our report to the meeting right now, to the BCA. So Chris, Thanks. take it Thank away. You. Um, does everybody have a copy of the report that was sent out yesterday? Yes, I do. Okay, so um, I think it would be helpful if there's any questions along the way to ask questions along the way, just so we don't lose them, okay? Sounds good. Okay, um, so the inspection committee went to the Bowdoin property um, on August 12th, and we spent approximately an hour and a half to two hours there uh, looking over the uh, um, property, uh, the, the house, the land, the outbuildings. Uh, and, and then we um, got together and prepared the report, which you now have in your hands. Um, so there, um, the, we, we wanted to be very detailed in our report um, just because of the, um, the issues that are involved here. And based on the original appeal, uh, there were four major areas of dispute um, involving the uh, um, appraisal, which the Bowdens had done, um, and the Lister's assessment of the uh, property. Uh, so the Lister's originally um, prepared um, a report from March, uh, May 26, 2020, uh, which um, after grievance, I understand was modified uh, and their um, modification appears in the uh, cost update report of June 24, 2020. Um, and then the Bones presented a, um, an appraisal that they had performed on June 19th of this year and we had that, and they presented that at the hearing on July 28th. Um, so when we did our inspection, we paid particular attention to the areas that were uh, raised in dispute, even though we know that once um, a, um, a challenge to the property valuation is lodged, it opens up the entire valuation and it's not limited to the issues that um, are claimed to be in dispute. Um, oh, Chris, so can I just interrupt briefly, sure. sorry. Um, I just want to make a, a point that while Chris is presenting um, our report um, to, I, I think, Chris, I would let you first do the report and then open it to the BCA for questions, um, because I don't want, uh, and then Scott gets some opportunity um, to, um, to speak as well. So I just don't want it to be suddenly where everybody's asking questions. Um, so if you don't mind. Okay, so I, I'm uh, fine with that. So I'll present the report and then so hold your questions and um, until the end. Okay, so um, the outbuildings uh, were in dispute and the, the listers, there are two outbuildings. Uh, one is a, um, a garage um, shed type building that uh, you come upon um, almost at the very start of the driveway. It's on the left-hand side, about 660 square feet. Uh, and the other is a larger barn um, that is located much closer to the, to the main house. Um, and so in the, the listers evaluated the outbuildings uh, at a total price of $85,300, um, $24,800 for the smaller building and $60,500 for the larger building. Um, in, uh, we. We reviewed the and inspected the um, barn closer to the house. Um, fairly new construction, um, part concrete floor, part gravel floor for equipment storage, uh, large enough to store heavy equipment like tractors. Um, it also had an upstairs um, a storage area that was accessible through um, a stairway that was located at the end of the building. Um, it is not insulated. We didn't see any source of heat um, in the barn building, uh, but 
large, well-constructed, uh, looks like well-maintained building. Um, and the same can be said for the, um, the, uh, the smaller building that's located down the driveway some. Um, it looked like it had some uh, field type equipment in it, uh, but a concrete floor, um, well-constructed. Both buildings had uh, um, mechanical doors, uh, garage doors that could be opened and closed um, um, with them mechanically. Uh, and the, um, the appraisal that the Bones had um, looked to us, it wasn't, wasn't completely clear, but given the uh, square footages that were identical, we thought that the uh, valuation on page 28 of that report for garage uh, which they valued at $28,492 was the same for the, um, was the same building that was located, the outbuilding down toward the beginning of the driveway. We did not see a valuation for the barn, uh, which was the bigger of the two um, outbuildings that were the subject of dispute. Uh, there's a um, reference to a barn uh, in the appraisal when the appraiser is doing the comparables, comparing the comparables that, that he used uh, in the appraisal. Um, and it's called, in the area called accessory, I think it's called accessories. Um, he mentions a barn and then another descriptor. So we, we concluded that that was the barn and also the um, other outbuilding, but we did not see a valuation on page 28 or 29 um, of the appraisal, the Bowden appraisal that dealt with the barn. Um, so that was our, our findings in terms of the outbuildings. Uh, the lot, um, the, the Bowdoin lot is up on Zidon Road. It, center, it also borders uh, Center Road for several, uh, like I think 900 feet of the languages. Uh, but it's, it's a um, nice piece of land um, accessible to the interstate, about four or five miles away from the interstate. Um, and up on Zidon Road, uh, the, there's a nice gradual descent to the driveway um, and ascent. Uh, and it's just, it's a nice piece of open land. There's about 80 acres of rolling meadow uh, that is, uh, that the house, um, you know, oversees. Uh, the house itself sits up on a, um, um, a pretty level building lot and has a very uh, nice view of the surrounding forested areas and the mountains that are uh, within view. It's southern facing. There are um, solar panels on, on the rooftop um, and just nicely situated piece of land. Uh, and in, in our view, uh, based on our, our evaluation, we did not understand why the listers um, reduced the grade for the five acre um, building area from a 2.2 down to a two. Um, and our recommendation in that regard was to increase it back to 2.2 because uh, the land is just a very nice piece of land. Uh, we also did not understand why it, uh, the 80 acres, the open acres um, that um, the house oversees and looks down on um, is graded at 1.5 and we'd like to um, have the, the listers um, revisit that particular grading uh, because it just seemed low to us um, as the inspectors. Uh, the next primary area of, of dispute uh, was the uh, sun porch. And this is a, a porch that is, is an enclosed uh, porch that uh, basically goes uh, across the front. Over You're losing the... you, Chris. What? We just lost you. You did? You have me back? Yeah. yeah. Now you okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's, um, it's a porch that is um, 540 square feet, if I'm recalling the, the number correctly. Uh, and it, it extends along the front of the house and then um, along the side of the house. Um, it is um, fully windowed, although I, Scott uh, Bowden describes the, uh, the windows as being um, basically um, like storm door inserts, which is accurate. The, the windows aren't, they don't go up and down, like you can't manipulate them um, so that you can move them up and they're halfway open. It's, um, they're either inserted in or not, um, but it's a screen porch 
Um, on one end, the, there's a uh, construction of a pizza oven, uh, cinder block construction, which is not yet complete, uh, but uh, would apparently uh, provide a source of heat in, in the cooler months. Uh, we did not see any type of systemic or systematic heating system uh, for this particular um, this sun porch area. Um, it looked nicely constructed to us uh, and the dispute in, in terms of the listers and the appraisal is that the listers had the uh, valuation for this particular um, um, area as $121,500. Um, and the appraisal had it at $26,741. Um, the multiplier that the appraiser, that the listers used uh, was 225. And what we were um, concerned about is whether or not uh, that was a multiplier that may have assumed that it was a heated porch. Uh, because I think in the original presentation, Eric uh, made, made some statements that he thought it was a heated porch um, but when we inspected the vents uh, that were on the floor, uh, they did look like they were drains uh, for any inclement weather that may have come in to, to the screening on, on the, uh, the porch area. So we just did not see any type of um, uh, heat source other than the pizza oven when it is completed. Um, the evaluation from the appraisal uh, was $26,741. Uh, which is just a significant difference um, on this particular space. Uh, it is, it is, we think, well constructed, as is the entire house. Um, and the, um, so we need to have the listeners just re reevaluate what the $225 uh, or the $225 qu a multiplier um, is based on uh, in order to reach a valuation on this particular part of the house. Chris, if I could just say, they also have glass panels that go into them as well. I agree, and right. So, so it can be a three season, it can be a three season porch because there are glass panels that will go into the screened areas um, to keep out the weather when it becomes uh, much worse, um, or at any time, put in at any time and keep out the rain. Um, the next item that we um, looked at. Uh, was the um, overall quality of the house. Uh, uh, Chris, can I just back up there, the porch, um, just uh, the, the actual front porch and just describe the, um, there's a slight confusion with the appraisal report. Yes. About. So, so with the appraisal report, it seemed that it may have uh, mixed up the porches because it describes uh, this enclosed um, porch um, as an enclosed wood deck screened walls, which is not what we saw. Um, and it, the, the front porch um, that is um, in the front, in the, it's in the back of the house, but it's where the driveway comes. So it's where you basically enter the house um, is a long porch that goes across the front of the house. There are columns holding, um, um, holding up a roof that shelters the porch <clears throat> but it's open. There's no screening. There's no knee walls. Um, it's just basically an open porch um, in in the front of the house. And the um, the appraisal from the Bowden appraisal described this uh, as a uh, enclosed porch, knee walls with glass. Um, so we think they just mixed up the descriptions for the two different two different areas with the. Uh, descriptor of the enclosed porch knee walls really being the sun porch and not the open porch uh, that uh, looks out on the driveway. Um, and so uh, the, so bear that in mind when you, if you're looking at the appraisal report. Um, any other? No, just that the multipliers then got mixed up too, so that the front porch was charged more per square footage than the right. enclosed so, back porch. Right. So in, in the all right, in the appraisal report, the front porch multiplier, at least according to the was at 59.09 as a multiplier, whereas the enclosed um, sun porch that was much bigger and went around the house was a multiplier of 43.93. So there just seemed it was 
there's some confusion there in the appraisal and I think it, it was mixed up um, on those two different items. Um, so the final thing that we um, looked at uh, was the overall quality of this home. Uh, and th we just, we thought it was a nicely um, constructed home, excellent quality throughout. Uh, it is, there's some question as to what is the degree of completion? Uh, the appraisal report uh, from the Bowdens had it at 95% completion. The Lister's report had it at 90%. Um, the uh, um, appraisal had the quality um, of the home at a 4.25 um, as opposed to, and, and then I think in our, our summary of the meeting, it said 4.75. But in, in the appraisal report, it said 4.25 for quality, good slash very good. Uh, and, but it rated the condition of the home as excellent uh, itself. So um, we just, we as a whole thought the house was in excellent condition being brand new. It's only not even a year old and still hadn't been completely completed when we did our inspection. And we thought that the quality was excellent. We did not think it was good um, or very good. We thought the quality of this home was excellent. And with that, we were recommending that the um, listers who originally uh, assessed the quality in their first uh, report as excellent, uh, that the uh, quality should be returned to the excellent quality rating of 6.0 as opposed to five. And so those are our, our recommendations, the conclusions that we came to and the recommendations um, in summary are uh, that we, we also deem the pond to be a very good quality and very good size, uh, not typical for a middle, most Middlesex ponds. Uh, we believe that the grade of 1.5 for the open, uh, 80 open acres is low and we recommend that the listers revisit this grading. Uh, we recommend that the grade of for the five acres be returned to 2.2 uh, from the 2.0 that it was lowered to in the second Mr. report. Uh, and we recommend that the listers review the value of the wraparound sun porch based on uh, our confirmation that it is a three season porch. Um, and it, with particular attention to that multiplier that they use um, for um, evaluating and uh, the value for the for that space, and we also recommend that the listers return return the quality rating um, to six point zero of excellent uh, from the five point zero um, rate that they had lowered it to in their second report. Okay, thanks, Chris. So Thank now I can invite the inspection. Um, uh, I'm sorry. Final questions from the BCA. And again, don't forget that um, we're gonna enter a deliberative session afterwards. So this is general questions on what Chris has presented to you that you need some clarification on. I, I can't vote, but can I ask a question? Um, I don't know, Sarah, is she able to ask a question? I think, I would think so. Well, uh, right now it's a public portion of the meeting, so anybody could ask. Okay, questions. sure. Yes, Mary. Um, did you come up with a new value or, or are you considering remanding it back to the listers? I'm confused about your end conclusion. We did not come up with a value um, because there were certain items that we did not have the information to do the evaluation for. Like for instance, the sun porch. We didn't know what the multiplier meant for the listers when they were using it. And if it was based on a heated space, we're assuming that that would be a different valuation than an unheated space. So, so you're basically suggesting it be remanded to the listers and then come back to you guys. Right. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? I'm good. Peter, are you okay? <laughs> You're muted.
Peter. He's unmuting. Sorry about that. I was trying to black out some of the grandchildren noise in the background. I'm fine. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay, so if there's no other questions from the BCA, um, Scott, would you like to make some comments to the report that Chris just presented? Yes, thank you, Liz. Uh, Liz, what's your pleasure here? I, I sent to Sarah this morning, which she forwarded on some of my factual uh, re replies to the inspection report. Do you want to go through those or shall we assume that people have read those? Why don't you go through them, Scott? That would be helpful. Okay. Um, so I'm just starting from the, the first page and just working through the report. All I was commenting on here are, are matters of fact, and I, I, I omitted any editorialization. So the first is the report mentions that there's custom cabinetry. There are not custom cabinets. These are, those are catalog order cabinets. Um, the report characterizes the basement as nearly finished. I don't know what that means, but I clarify that there is no finished flooring, there is no finished ceiling, there are no light fixtures, unpainted sheetrock walls, no baseboard trim. Um, I'm not sure that that qualifies for finished basement. Um, there was some mention about a server for state-of-the-art internet connectivity, and I wish that were true. But I have occasional DSL service from... Uh, consolidated, so I, I'm not sure what, what that reference was about. Um, what, I, what you saw was a firewall. It was a security appliance. It was not an internet connectivity thing. Um, the report mentions a two-car garage with radiant floor heat. There is no heat in the garage of any kind. So I don't, I don't know where that came from. The only radiant in the building is in approximately half of the basement. So it's in the basement main room and in the basement, um, the far right room and that has the, the attached bath. The office with the attached bath has a uh, radiant floor. There is no other radiant floor anywhere in the house. Or Can garage. I just ask that question, Scott? Yes. Can I just ask a question of that? Because yeah. on the list of the report, it's, um, Eric said that he talked to you about it and you said there is radiant floor, but it's not hooked up in the garage. No, there, no, no, there is radiant heat in the basement only. There is no radiant heat in the garage. There's radiant heat in the basement, which in fact is not hooked up because we're using you know, solar and heat pumps and all that. It's a redundant system in the event that we lose power for an extended period of time okay. that we'll have at least some heat in the house. Okay, good to know. Um, the smaller garage, I'm on the second page of the report, we're talking about the smaller garage, which we call the shed, uh, mentions that you could store cars. I'm just clarifying that that shed, which is 800 feet from the house, is built on enrolled land, and land that's enrolled in, in UVA current use. So the use of that shed is restricted to only being able to store forestry and agricultural equipment. It cannot store cars or personal property. Okay, the next item talks about you can't find the value for the red barn on the appraisal report. And Chris, you mentioned a few things about um, the re appraisal report in general. And I, I, I first, I think I need to clarify that the appraisal report reaches its conclusion of value based on two methodologies. So in the appraisal report, there's a sales comparison approach methodology, and then there's a cost approach methodology. And those two methodologies are averaged, in this case, 50-50, to come up with the conclusion of value. It seems as though all of the questions that you are asking about in the appraisal report, you were referring only to the cost basis method, the cost method on page 27, because it only applied to, those questions only applied to that. There is, you may have missed the, on page, the beginning of the report, where it's the sales comparison approach. So just that's just an overall comment. There are two, essentially there are two appraisals in the appraisal. They each come to their own sub-conclusion, which is that average to come to the conclusion of the appraisal report. Now in the cost approach section, where you mentioned that the barn is 
not there, you're correct. The barn was omitted mistakenly from the cost approach. So that part of the appraisal omitted the barn. And I also note in my email, and I'll make note here, that there are two other errors on that cost report. One is that the entire house, all 3,500 square feet has radiant heat and heat pump heat, and that's not accurate. There's, there's only approximately 700 feet of radiant heat, which leads to an overstatement of value. And then the other error on the report is, uh, let's see here, finished. Oh, shows the, the entire basement, all 1700 square feet is being finished, which as you all saw, that clearly was not the case. Half the basement is storage rooms. It's not, not finished space. So if you net those three omissions, the, th the error of the barn being included, not being included, but you reduce the radiant heat and the square foot of the basement, you've actually reduced the appraisal. The, the conclusion for the cost approach is actually higher than it should be if you fix those three errors. Not by much, but it's, it's, it's higher. But I do note that that has nothing to do with the sales comparison approach. The sales comparison approach was not encumbered by any of these errors. Uh, moving on to the lot, there's mention about 80 acres of land, uh, open acreage. There is not 80 acres of land. There hasn't been, as far as we can tell, for 30 years. At best, there's 40 acres of open land. I've never measured it. I can only use Google Maps to use their measurement tool. It looks like it's about 40 acres of open land. There, I, my understanding is, as many years ago, there were 80 acres. But John Rock planted 40 acres of pine trees, which are now adult, you know, 30 foot pine trees. Uh, the mention about the pond and the quality, you know, I sort of view this as being, um, you know, I, I, don't, I don't, from a tax perspective, it's not going to impact my tax bill any. That pond is in the UVA area. I'm going to be taxed at $151 an acre, no matter what the valuation that the town puts on the tax bill. So you know, it's, it's not really, I don't, I guess I don't really care um, about any of the, any of the valuation of any of the acreage other than the two acre house site, because all of that land is UVA. And the only thing that the valuation matters is what you guys as the town get back from the state for the, whatever that program is, where they give you some money back for land that's in UVA, but has really nothing to do with what I'm going to pay for taxes. So I'll stay out of that. Um, it mentions that we put the land in conservation. Actually, the land was put in conservation by the prior owner. Uh, there's mention about the McCullough Hill property, um, which has fewer acreage. So again, what we're, what, what we're proposing here, what we're setting forth is that the value of the house in the two acres, not in UVA, is what we're what we produced the appraisal for, the house and the two acres. The McCullough Hill house had 25 acres. So it mentions that it has fewer acres and really it does not have fewer acres. What we're talking about, the appraisal is, a, is two acres versus 25. And then lastly, it's a, it's a small thing because I don't think it's even germane to this. You're talking about the pizza oven which wasn't even started on April 1st. In fact, the porch wasn't even started on April 1st at all. Um, I, I don't know that I, we need to get into the minutia on that, uh, but there's talk about the, the pizza oven providing uh, a heat source and that's actually not how that oven, oven is designed. It has an eight inch unbampered draft. It actually requires to be a window to be open or a door to be open for it to actually work because um, there would otherwise would be negative air pressure in the room and you'd fill with smoke. So there's, that's just not the way that oven, oven works. Um, again, I don't think it's neither here nor there. But. So those are my comments with regard to the inspection report. And I did wanna just make a few comments about this you know, overall where I, I think this process is. That my, my understanding is, is that the objective of this body is to determine the fair market value of the property. And, and the fair market value of the property is a concept that's very well defined by the law. Um, and it specifically sets forth, the law sets forth the process that when you have a property like ours, that is a mixture of enrolled land and UVA and unenrolled property, that you must value the unenrolled property as a standalone property, which we've done. And then 
add in the enroll property. So the, the, I think the law is very clear about what needs to be done to arrive at a fair market value in a property such as ours. And there's been a lot of discussion amongst this, you know, the inspection committee and the listers about the attributes of the property and you know, what features it has and doesn't have, but what, what is absent curiously, which seems to be the only objective under the law is any analysis of how any of these attributes actually comport to the property's market value, its fair market value. We have produced credible evidence that fairly and reasonably shows that the listed value of our property is greater than the fair market value. Vermont courts have consistently held that an appraisal completed by a licensed appraiser meets the standard needed to overcome the presumption of validity of the listed value. It is now up to the listers to introduce evidence that justifies the listed value. And I'm gonna quote just one sentence from the Vermont Handbook on Property Tax Assessment Appeals, page 11. Quote, in short, once the taxpayer puts, some credible, puts on some credible evidence, the listers must be prepared to defend their appraisal. They cannot rest on a defense based on the grand list alone. End quote. There has been no such evidence presented. So the BCA is now left to determine the fair market value of this property. It seems to have three choices. Accept our asserted value based on the evidence that we provided, which is the only evidence of fair market value that has been presented to the BCA. Accept the listers, the listed value, or I, I think the only other option, I, like, I heard Mary ask the question about remanding to the listers. I didn't even know that was an option, is to come up with your own value. And it seems to me that the, a value, if you're going to come up, either accept the listers value or come up with your own value, it needs to be based on evidence. And in this case, inexplicably to us, no evidence supporting the town's value was presented as required. We're hopeful, Gretchen and I are hopeful that the BCA will reach a decision based on evidence and facts. And you know that you're required by law to include the basis of your decision in your written document, in your written decision. So we'll be, we'll be very interested to see what facts are included in the promulgation of your conclusion. In, in, in conclusion, all we're really asking for here is to be treated like any other taxpayer in town to be taxed at the fair market value of our property. This process provided the forum for the town to demonstrate how it was meeting is this basis, basic fairness obligation to show any support at all that their appraisal was equal to or even close to fair market value. Again, no evidence was submitted to support their conclusion. We're left to conclude absent of any evidence to the contrary that the value that we are asserting is the fair market value. That's all I have. Okay, thank you, Scott. Um, so our agenda says invite final comments from the listers, but I don't think there's they, a list. They're not here. I think I would move to go into deliberative session. Yeah, okay. So, um, we're going to close the hearing um, and we're going to, Scott, just so you know, that we're going to enter the deliberative session um, and then we present a written decision um, within 15 days. Great. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Scott.